Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me properly, but I want to welcome you to our second virtual marine discovery series lecture for the year. Um, good evening. My name is Stefan Sewell. I'm the Community Outreach and Education Program Manager at the National Marine Science Center in Coffs Harbor with Southern Cross University. Uh, I do want to welcome you all tonight to our, our virtual uh, event. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the, the Gumbangia people, and I will like to just pay my respects to those past, present, and future elders. Tonight, um, we have uh, a PhD candidate from Southern Cross University at the National Marine Science Center, uh, Nicola Frazier. She is uh, conducting her work. She's, she's done it for a couple of years now. Uh, she's actually been with us in the aquarium as well. So she's well-rounded and well-versed in many different aspects of the marine environment. And um, she tonight is going to be talking about the uh, sea anemones and their use in the aquarium industry. Obviously, we know that uh, the, aquarium, the aquarium trade is uh, a fairly large and lucrative um, organization. Uh, however, there's not a lot of regulation when it comes to uh, you know, recording what's actually being taken from our oceans. So obviously aquaculture, the farming of these things um, will uh, be important, but I'm sure Nicola will give us all the details about this uh, in this wonderful lecture tonight. So um, before we get started with Nicola, I would just like to um, include that if you would like to ask a question, our Q&A, down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a, um, a little Q&A, um, little voice bubbles. Um, you can uh, ask a question, uh, and then what, what I'll do is we'll, I'll uh, monitor them and, um, and, and read them out at the end of the, uh, at the end of Nicola's talk, and then we're gonna go uh, and, and get her to, to hopefully answer them for you. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Nicola to turn her uh, screen on and her and unmute herself. That'd be great. Hi, Stefan. I'll Fantastic. See Hi, Nicola. See if I can get all this working and press. That's the great. And we'll just share buttons. your screen and we'll we'll let you run. It's having a rest. There we go. Uh, oh, I forgot to press share screen. That helps. Hang on. <laughs> share screen. Um, that one. That's the one. Fantastic. Oh, Great. Uh, okay. Well, without further ado, Nicola Frazier. Thank you very much. I've just lost another screen. So you'll just have to bear with me for a minute. I'm sorry. Ah, now I have what I wanted. <laughs> okay. I thought I, I couldn't see anything there for a minute. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is a great idea, this virtual thing. I just have to get used to it. So some of you will know what sea anemones are. For those who don't, they're soft-bodied marine animals um, and they live in a wide variety of habitats from shallow rock pools to deep in the ocean. Some of them are well known because they host anemone fish uh, and some receive publicity as a result of the popular 2003 animated movie Finding Nemo. So host anemones and their anemone fish are among the most common animals in the marine aquarium trade. And while some anemone fishes are captive bred, the majority of sea anemones available for sale are actually wild harvested. So during my PhD, I've been addressing some of the issues around the trade in sea anemones. And what I'm going to do is start by giving you some background and then I'll run through the research I've conducted and some of the interesting things I've found so far. So freshwater aquarium keeping started with wealthy Roman and Chinese people holding live fish at home for labour consumption. I've even read about them keeping fishing tanks under their beds, which I thought sounded interesting. The marine aquarium trade, however, started in Sri Lanka in the 1920s. Um, it gradually built up in volume and then technological advances in the 1950s and 1960s meant that international trade in aquatic animals became a lot easier. So these advances included, for example, plastic bags, 
which were somewhat easier to handle and lighter than the previously used metal tanks. Mass air transport, which meant that uh, animals got to market a lot faster than just using boat and road transport. Uh, electricity became more available and it was then um, useful for powering water, air pumps and filters that had also been invented. And another uh, invention, for want of a better word, that improved things was something called ultraviolet sterilisation, which helps kill pathogens that often cause problems in closed aquarium systems. So what it boils down to is by the 1970s, there were around 30 Indo-Pacific countries exporting uh, animals for the marine aquarium trade, mostly fish. A rapid expansion of trade occurred from the 1990s and continued until it peaked at around 2007. And also around that time, people decided they wanted things other than fish. So there was a bit of an expansion in the variety of uh, animals that were sold. A decline occurred after 2007, probably as a result of the global financial crisis. Aquarium keeping is a luxury hobby and spending on luxuries always declines during times when money is tight. Now, I just need to tell you that there is limited accurate or detailed information um, available about the proper extent of the marine aquarium trade. So some figures that I'm about to give you are generally agreed in the literature, but not actually supported, or they're not all supported by hard data. But currently there are at least 80 countries exporting a, a total of more than 40 million animals each year of at least two and a half thousand species and the annual value of these is in excess of 300 million United States dollars. The majority of exports come from developing countries, uh, particularly the Philippines and Indonesia, also Papua New Guinea, Haiti and Fiji. Uh, there are some developed countries that export, Australia is one of those, also Hawaii and Hong Kong. On the other hand, most customers are in developed countries. Uh, having an aquarium, as I've already said, is a luxury, uh, particularly a marine aquarium. Apparently, they cost a whole lot more to run. So the United States of America is the primary importer, being the destination for between 60 and 70% of animals in the trade, followed by the European Union, which takes around 14%, and another 7% go to Japan. Now, most traded marine animals are wild caught. And there are questions about the sustainability of the relevant fisheries and the trade in general. Despite their illegality in many countries, unsustainable fishing practices are still being used in some areas. These include overharvesting, abrasive nets, coral crushing, and as demonstrated in this picture, and this one, cyanide fishing. The cyanide has an anaesthetizing effect and is used to sort of stun the fish and make them easier to catch. Unfortunately, it can also kill animals and is definitely non-selective. Uh, it not only kills animals at the time of application, but it can also have uh, delayed effects. There's such unsustainable practices have led in some locations to localised population reductions and even localised extinctions. Another sustainability concern about the marine aquarium trade is something called supply chain mortality, which basically refers to deaths that occur between the fisher and the consumer. And the rate of these is, can be as high as 80%. So for every 10 animals collected, eight of them die in some cases. These deaths are the result of lots of factors, including poor packaging and transport practices and the delayed effects of cyanide fishing. Many countries where collection takes place lack suitable regulations and or resources for management and compliance. So you may be able to see from this why there are concerns about sustainability. It's not all bad news, however. Fisheries supplying the trade often provide income for coastal communities in developing countries, which is obviously a good thing. Additionally, well-managed fisheries can encourage marine stewardship. One of the ways this works is that communities can learn to value the habitats from which they source fish because they can view them as uh, valuable for economic or for educational purposes, and therefore they may want to look after them. 
Now, aquaculture is something you may have heard of. This is growing plants and animals in water. And aquaculture supplies around 90%, so that's nearly all of the animals and plants in the freshwater aquarium trade. But less than 10% of the marine aquarium trade is supplied by what's called mariculture or marine aquaculture. So there's a big difference there. Mariculture offers benefits to fishers, traders and consumers, as well as having the potential to reduce collection pressures on wild populations. It can also provide new income streams and employment. For example, this photo was taken in the Solomon Islands, where coral culture for the trade is usually undertaken by women who may otherwise have no employment whatsoever. Now, to get on the specifics of sea anemones, there are over a thousand species of sea anemone around the world. Of those, 10 are known to host one or more of 28 tropical and subtropical anemone fishes. You may have seen that movie, and they're called, a lot of people call them Nemo's. There are, they're not all exactly the same species, they're all anemone fishes. These anemone fishes cannot live in the wild without a host anemone. The anemones themselves uh, have a better survival in the wild if they have an anemone fish present. Sea anemones in general are widely traded and we know their collection for the marine aquarium trade has caused population depletions and even localised extinctions in some areas. Mariculture of sea anemones could possibly alleviate some of the negative impacts of wild collection, but there's been almost no research conducted into captive breeding methods for sea anemones. So for my PhD, I decided to approach this subject from three different perspectives. Firstly, I conducted an online survey to investigate the most popular species and also consumer attitudes towards captive bred and wild harvested anemones. Secondly, I carried out some research with immature anemones in order to make a start on learning about mariculture methods for anemones spawning captivity. And thirdly and finally, I worked with five different species of sea anemone to further our knowledge of the requirements for asexually cultivating sea anemones in captivity. Now I'll work through these three angles, explain them a little bit more and tell you a little of what I did and found. So one of the problems I encountered when initially planning my PhD is there is limited information available about the sea anemone market preferences or what consumers think about the sustainability of the product. So I contacted more than a thousand business, businesses and aquarist forums using email, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn and boy that was a learning experience. Uh, and I ended up with 445 responses from 39 countries. Of those, 364 were aquarists and 90% of those were private hobbyists. 81 businesses and 81% of those were retailers. In terms of numbers from various countries, 136 people or respondents came from the, lived in the United States, 125 in Australia, 58 in the United Kingdom and 34 in Mexico. Uh, that graph only includes countries from which I received eight or more responses. 39 countries were not going to fit on a page, and I promise there won't be very many graphs. I just wanted to give you a bit of an indication of the spread of it. So, what did I learn? I learned that the most popular species by a long way was something called Entapnea quadricolor. This species lives locally in the Solitary Islands Marine Park, and you can see them in the Solitary Islands Aquarium, if my mouth works properly, that is um, at Charlesworth Bay. One of the common names is bubble-tipped anemone, and you can see why from the two pictures on the left there. The bubble tips are not always present, but when they are, they're very distinctive. So looking at the graph on the right, the popularity is on the left, so the higher up the graph, the little marks are, the more popular they are. And you can see in Tapnia quadricolor, the first one, 
is up there and the next most popular ones are a fair way down the graph so it was definitely more popular than the others. The main reasons participants gave for preferring these colour were its suitability for hosting anemone fish, the ease of keeping and its appearance mainly in terms of colour with pink or red being the most popular colour and you can see the pink one in that picture is quite pretty. Interestingly, although there's a lot of discussion on hobbyist forums about how important the bubble tips are, only one respondent out of all those people listed the bubble tips as a reason for preferring this anemone. I found that really surprising and it was a good reminder to me that anecdotal evidence or what people chat about is quite different to scientific evidence. Then to look at the, uh, ask the same question another way in sort of this backup data, I asked businesses which were their best selling species. They also indicated that Impacnia quadricolor was the best selling by a long way. 74% of businesses listed it as their best selling species. Of the others listed, so the best selling is the bottom, is at the bottom of that graph working your way up. Numbers three and four, Condylactus gigantea and Stichodilla tapetum, and I promise there won't be a pest at the end of all these names. They do not host anemone fish. So the hosting, uh, the, the anemone fish hosting is not vital. Other, other anemones are still of interest to hobbyists for a lot of different reasons. I then went on and asked people about their attitudes towards captive bred and wild harvested sea anemones. So the first question was whether they would prefer to buy captive bred or wild harvested, and it turns out they would definitely prefer captive bred. Nearly all of them said they prefer to buy captive bred. I then asked if they would be prepared to pay more for captive bread. My thinking here was that we don't know how much it's going to cost to maricol to see anemones. It may, they may be more expensive than wild harvested. And so I wanted to know if people might be prepared to pay more if they were available. And again, the majority of them were prepared to pay more. They were asked an open question for, uh, about why they, they were prepared to pay more and why they wanted them. And the overwhelming response was that they wanted to support the sustainable trade of sea anemones. So those are the major results of the survey. I then went on to look at sea anemone reproduction. And Steve Whalen, a researcher from Southern Cross University, helped to enable this component of my PhD. So unlike anemone fishers, sea anemones can be difficult to raise in captivity. This is partly because we don't know a lot about the reproductive biology of most anemones. What we do know is that as a group, sea anemones have the most amazing range of reproductive strategies. And I could talk to you for hours about that. It's just fascinating. That's not where we're going today. But um, what? I look, what you have seen in front of you is uh, anemone spawning. So the anemone on your left, I'm assuming you have the same left that I have, is releasing eggs. The anemone on the right is a male releasing sperm. The eggs and the sperm are buoyant. They float up in the water column. As they float, in theory, with a bit of luck, they mix. Eventually, the, with extra luck, the sperm meets the egg and we have a fertilised cell egg, which turns into an embryo. Now, anemones are cnidarians, which means they're related to corals. Once coral eggs are fertilised and become larvae, they actively seek an appropriate place to live. When they find this, they settle down and stay in one place for the rest of their lives. And I'm pretty sure you will have seen David Attenborough waxing eloquent about uh, coral spawning and, um, and having beautiful pictures of brightly coloured corals. Anemones have a very similar life cycle, the ones we know about, but they're able to move for their entire lives. So some of them can sort of walk along the bottom um, and some of them can even swim. The majority of them stay pretty put, but they are able to move. So successful mariculture requires specific knowledge of a number of factors, particularly those relating to the care of juvenile animals. Information is scant about sea anemone culture, so I decided to investigate some of the missing details. 
the first major step was to acquire anemone babies. For this, I needed adult anemones. In my case, this involved diving out at North Solitary Island to collect the anemones. This requires a Department of Primary Industries research permit and is carried out very carefully. So we only ever collect anemones in which no anemone fish are currently living. We don't want to take their homes away. Um, and the species we used were Heteractus crispa. The other thing we do is collect them very carefully so as not to damage them. And this photo of Sophie shows her holding Heteractus crispa, a leathery sea anemone in her hand. Um, she brought up the rock and the shell, frag, broken shell that it was attached to so that she wouldn't injure the animal. But these animals were brought back to the National Marine Science Centre where they were kept in a special tank. And you can see that on the left. These tanks have flow through seawater and they're protected from potential predators. The anemones spawn at night on a cycle related to that of the moon. So for at least two weeks after every full moon from January to May in 2018 and 2019, I check the tanks every half hour or so from dusk until late at night and then came back again early in the morning, hoping to observe spawning and to collect fertilised eggs. The anemones did spawn. And the next step was to check that fertilisation had occurred. So spore, uh, eggs, sperm, they mix, sometimes they just don't meet each other. Sometimes the sperm and the egg, maybe they talk a different language. I don't know what the technical term is, but they don't necessarily, you don't necessarily end up with a fertilized egg. So I had to check that they were fertilized. Now the picture on the right is some um, eggs. It turned out they were fertilized embryos floating on the surface. Just something I'd like you to note in that picture, I hope you can see it on your screens, is the little pink bits underneath. That's actually something called encrusting coralline algae. It's not a soft algae like seaweed. You might think of the seaweed you see on the beach. It's a firm one. If you go down to rock pools very often, you might see it. Uh, it, it sort of looks like a hard corally thing, but it's actually algae. I'll mention that because I'll talk about it later. So, I carefully scooped up some of those floating eggs, took them upstairs to the laboratory and looked at them under a microscope. Luckily, I was able to tell that cell division had started indicating I had viable embryos. So the picture here, I think you can see my little cursor. These three on the right, the greeny ones, you can see they're a bit lumpy. That's what happens, sperm meets single celled egg. So they, um, what's it called, fertilization occurs, cell division starts. So we've got one cell, two, four, etc. The three on the right are lumpy because they're earlier in their cell division than those slightly smoother ones on the right. Something to note here, the little spots, they're algal cells. They're tiny weeny little algae that, that um, live inside the sea anemone. And I'm going to talk about those in a few slides time as well. So back down to the tank farm, carefully transfer the eggs to inside, uh, room inside with controlled conditions where they were reared in tubs until they developed into larvae. So the tubs on the right, very difficult to see, but they actually have lots and lots of tiny little larvae swimming around in them. And here's a picture of some embryos floating around on top. But two days after spawning, the embryos had changed or metamorphosed into larvae. And they sort of looked a little bit like tiny greenish black beans. And they were happily swimming around these big rearing tubs. So the next job was to count the larvae into vials. These vials, you may have seen one before. They're commonly used for medical samples. They're lightweight, they're a suitable size for the experiment and they allow light penetration. They're also round, so they don't really have much in the way of corners for stagnant water to get caught in. A team of us counted a total of 27,000 larvae into 120 vials in one long day for the first experiment. We used microscopes. We used a cool perspex tool, which is that flat thing you can see there with the ridges in it called a bogger off tray and the fine glass tube is a pipette, and we use those to ensure that we selected only the healthy looking larvae. No point in starting an experiment with larvae that don't look very healthy. 
So we counted them out and we transferred them to individual vials. I had them colour coded with uh, electrical tape, so for the colour differences. And this one in particular, in the middle of this picture, would eventually hold 1,040 larvae, which is the equivalent of 20,000 larvae per litre. You can see why I didn't want to do a whole litre. That would have been a lot of counting. So what I was trying to find out was how the larvae survived in different water conditions at different densities. So I had a range of densities from the equivalent of 192 larvae per litre up to 20,000 larvae per litre. I had four different water treatments. I had raw seawater, basically straight from the ocean then came through a, a coarse filter. Ultraviolet sterilised water that I've already talked about to help kill some of the pathogens. I had filtered seawater down to 0.45 of a micron. Now, if you think that the, about the human hair, the finest human hair starts at about 17 microns, so 0.45 of a micron is pretty fine. And then an antibiotic treatment. Antibiotics are often used in aquaculture uh, in a similar way to the ultraviolet sterilisation. They kill the pathogens uh, or help to reduce the number of pathogens that can really kill uh, larvae of various marine animals. So approximately, oh, I put them all out on a bench. You can see on the, the uh, bottom corner, bottom right hand corner, they're colour coded for the different water types. They weren't all blue, that was just an easy photo for me. And they were all labelled so I knew the densities. And approximately 60 hours after the experiment started, the larvae were beginning to metamorphose. What this meant in this case, that they were changing and instead of having little fake beans looking critters, it was possible to see the beginnings of tentacles on the end, they were so cute. At this point, I gathered up all the vials, picked up these and counted the survivors in each one. Now, you might remember the algal spots I mentioned earlier when I was looking at the um, embryos under the microscope. All the larval experiments were conducted under special lighting because these anemones contain algae in a similar manner to many hard corals. The algae are partly responsible for the colours of the anemone and the corals, and they provide the anemones with some food in the form of product of photosynthesis. So the light just allowed the algae to photosynthesise. I was able to run this experiment three times. The overall results were not particularly clear, and basically further recommended Further research is recommended working with the range of densities of water treatments. That was not the end of it though. I then looked at settlement. So settlement is in the case of corals, as I explained, embryo, larvae, turn into a little coral, ready to live permanently. Anemone similar, it just doesn't stay in the same spot. So certain coral are known to have likes and dislikes when it comes to settlement. So I was expecting anemones to have some preferences. Um, because I wanted to know if there was a difference in settlement among water treatments, we put the same number of larvae into each vial. I use these cute little vials here. It's all of 20 millilitres. And we used the same water treatments as for the previous experiment. So the raw water, ultraviolet sterilised, filtered and antibiotic treatment. But I also used four of what I call soups. So these soups were made by soaking an adult anemone of the same species, an anemone fish of the species that normally lives in this anemone, some sargassum seaweed, which is a fine seaweed that you'll often find on the beach, and crustose algae in ultraviolet sterilised seawater for four hours. So crustose algae is that pink algae I mentioned earlier that was on the bottom of the tanks. And it forms a hard crust, or crust if I can say it properly, on rocks. And it's something that encourages some corals to settle. So I thought maybe the anemones might like to settle there too. To make that particular soup, I scraped some of the algae off rocks and crushed it a bit like in a mortar and pestle and then soak that in the water. So the little vials were all labelled and filled with the relevant soups. For this experiment, I waited until five days after spawning, by which time the anemones were pretty well ready to settle down and begin a more sedentary life. 
Again, we counted out larvae. This time we put 10 in each vial. We kept them with little perspex tiles, pre-drilled with tiny holes. Because the thinking here is that anemones are not naturally going to find anything nice and smooth like a perspex tile out in the ocean. So they're not going to think to settle on that. They would normally settle on some sort of rough surface. So drilling holes gave them a bit of a, an impression of a rough surface. We turned the vials upside down, and then, as you can see, we used very high-tech, not a bad method, to secure the tiles to the vials. After 48 hours, we counted those that were attached to a surface or somewhat settled, and those swimming around. The research question was, is there an effect of water treatment on the settlement of Heteractus crispa? That's the species we're using. Uh, larvae. The overall result was that although there were fewer larvae settled in the sargassum soup, the seaweed soup, than the other seven water treatments, the difference was not statistically significant, meaning we couldn't attribute the difference to the water treatment. It could have just been chance. This is actually quite interesting, and it means from a mariculture perspective, water treatment may not be especially important for the settlement of anemone larvae. So, I'm doing something about collecting and checking fertilised eggs, rearing them to larval stage and keeping them alive in different water treatments until they were ready to settle. Move on to the next bit. When we're breeding animals in captivity, we normally need to feed them. So the next experiment involved five different feeding regimes to see if the larvae thrived better with one of these. The different regimes were firstly no feeding, just leaving the animals to photosynthesize under the photosynthetic lights. Uh, artemia, enriched artemia or dried artemia. Now, I'll tell you in a minute what artemia is, but enriched artemia just meant, um, means adding lipids, adding special fats, and it's something that's commonly done in aquaculture. The fats improve the growth of some fish. Um, and then there was a commercial anemone feed. Now, three of these options use Artemia. I can't see you in my audience, but I'm imagining that some of you might be about my age and you might remember back to cereal packets advertising sea monkeys as pets. I always wanted sea monkeys and I was never allowed to have them. It turns out sea monkeys are Artemia, a type of crustacean like a prawn or, or a crab, are commonly used as food in mariculture. I look a bit weird. There's a picture of a, a very young one over on the left-hand corner. So I learned to hatch Artemia. In fact, Stefan taught me how to hatch, hatch Artemia for this experiment, but I finally got to keep sea monkeys. It turns out not only are they a useful food, they're incredibly hardy, and I could rabbit on about them for ages too, but that's another story. Back to the enemies. Yet again, we counted larvae into vials, and we were pretty good at it this time, and it was really easy because we only had 50 vials. We had one, two, three, four, five different feeds and only 10 vials of each and only one anemone into each vial. I fed the larvae and cleaned the tubs regularly for three months. Along the way, I measured their size and I counted their tentacles. At the end, I counted and measured the survivors. The basic results were that the anemone larvae grew best when fed the two different live artemia options. And just to finish up the talk about the sexual reproduction mariculture, here are some pictures of Heteractus crispa larvae, the species I was using, at about a year of age. The one on the right is the largest and it's about a centimetre across, so they don't grow very fast. The next step was to learn about asexual CNM in mariculture. Among the many reproductive strategies used by sea anemones um, is one form of asexual reproduction. Now, asexual just means basically without sperm and eggs. In this case, there's something called longitudinal fission. And in this case, and it's done with quite a few anemones, the anemone stretches itself in two directions and splits, resulting in two clones. This happens naturally but it happens re relatively rarely, and it's certainly inadequate to meet market demands. It, longitudinal fission has been successfully replicated manually. You just cut an anemone in half with a knife, 
It's known as fragmentation and it has been proven to be successful with Entapnea quadricolor, that species I mentioned earlier as the most popular in the trade. But we didn't know if fragmentation was suitable for other sea anemones. So I did some work with five different species. Now, the five that I used, four of them were available locally. One I had to buy in Western Australia. Again, of the five, three um, were intertidal anemones, so finding rock pools here. One is subtitle and here, and that's the Heteractus crispa that we used for the other experiments. Uh, and the, uh, the other subtitle one is one from Western Australia. Also of that five, uh, three are sold to a lesser and greater extent within the marine aquarium trade. And only one is known to, no, sorry, none of them are known to naturally use longer tube or fish. So I had a variety. Um, I'm just going to run through them really quickly with you to give you an idea of what I was playing with. So if you've played with rock pool, been in rock pools here at all, likely you will have seen this one. It's called the Waratah anemone, Actinia tenebrosa. It grows to a maximum diameter of about five centimetres. It's a gorgeous red colour. It's sometimes seen in really great numbers in local rock pools. When it's above water, it closes up. So it's really high on the rock platform. It's often left high and dry at low tide. It can look like port wine jelly or it can even just look like brown. It's quite smooth when it's all closed up, stop it drying out. When it's open, it's this fantastic crimson colour. And although the details have not been confirmed, we know it sometimes uses a form of asexual reproduction. So the picture on the right is a little juvenile one. It do, this anemone doesn't split. It's thought to somehow bud the anemone. So the thought is that on the what's called the oral disc, which is where the tentacles stick out from, makes a little bud. The anemone pops out and then it does this really cool thing. It actually broods them in its mouth until they're ready for it to go out in the wide world. I think that's really cool. In the middle of this anemone on your left is its mouth. Uh, just so you know, anemones only have one orifice. So that's its mouth and its bottom, all in one thing, save space. Another intertidal rock pool species is this Alactinia varatra. It grows to a maximum of about 10 centimetres diameter, a bit lower on the rock platform, so you don't see it high and dry so often. It has a rougher surface and longer tentacles. This one is further down again, Alactinia australiensis. Um, it's really pretty. It's only small, grows to a maximum diameter of about 3 centimetres. Variety of brownie colours, as you can see from these two pictures. Very distinctive little mauve, pretty mauve tips on the tentacles. Uh, you can see the mouth in the middle of both of those ones. Um, but they, and they're never left high and dry. They're very low on the rock platform. The intertidal one that I was using for the sexual reproduction experiments is Heteractus crispa. You can't see its mouth because its tentacles are too long. Uh, grows to a maximum size of 50 centimetres diameter, generally 20 to 30. This is the only one of the five that I worked on that hosts anemone fishes. Uh, and there are 14 different species that it hosts in the wild, not 14 at once and not 14 in one location because the fish don't all live in the same location. But around the world, a total of 14 different species. Uh, here, it's, its depth of um, preference ranges from about 10 to 20 metres. So we definitely have to collect it and screw them. Uh, and the last, number five, is called Psychodactylus petum or a mini maxi. It's quite popular in the anemone trade. It's only small, grows to about 15 centimetres, short tentacles, comes in some quite bright colours. I didn't need colours for this experiment. Also, I bought the cheaper brownie ones, although the one on the right, the picture is here because that one changed colours sometimes during the experiment. I don't know why, but a couple of times it went the most incredible cobalt blue. Okay, so the research question was, can manual fragmentation be used successfully in anemone species other than in tachyon quadricolor? So I started with 16 of each of five species. I cut eight of each in half. I randomly placed them among the um, 
or four different big tanks outside in the, uh, at the National Marine Aquarium, at National Marine Science Centre, we'd flow through water, uh, clean their tubs, fed them three times a week and recorded survival daily for close on two months. So when the whole experiment was set up, this is just an indication of what one species looked like, how it was all spread out. The point of random placement here, among anything else, is that if, say, for some remote reason, the water got cut off to one tank, I didn't lose all of one species. Um, and this picture just gives you a bit of an idea. This is me playing around with setting things up and giving each little tub at time water supply. So I cut them in half and they started to heal. I'll just quickly run you through you some run you through some pictures of them healing. Um, so this one you can see it's closing in on itself, closing in a bit more. It's this this is the um, Actinia tenebrosa. It's here started to form a mouth at the bottom. And that one has formed a mouth and nearly completely healed. The green Alactinia viratra or snake lock um, anemone. You can see here, this is a side on view and you can see it's not fully healed. Some of the inside there is still showing. Here it's, it's healed, it's just not fully closed. And this one is almost completely closed and that white bit is its mouth or its orifice. This Actinia australiensis was upside down, so that was a good opportunity to take a photo. You can see in the um, upper left bit where it's healing here. And then this one is almost completely healed. I think if you turn this one over, you would be hard pressed to observe where the cut had been and the mouth is all almost completely in the middle. Now, because of the longer tentacles, it's a bit hard to see what's going on with the Heteractus crisper. Um, but again, the mouth is forming here. This one's pretty close to healed. And this is the scar, the healing scar, where it's been cut and it's come back in and healed itself. We obviously can't put band-aids on them to help them heal faster. Then we have the Stichodactyla tapetum. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the tropical ones. Now, none of these were upside down, so I can't tell you a photo of that. But again, you can see the mouth and you can see how it's closing, they're both closing in on themselves to heal. Um, they're good shots at how, you see how short their tentacles are. They're only little bobby tentacles. Um, before I, these came, these were flown over from West Australia. Before I received them, I read about them to learn and everything said, oh, they sting a lot. You've got to be really careful. Well, I didn't find that, but um, maybe I was just like, so. I haven't yet completed the analysis for this, so I can't tell you exactly what I found. There were definitely differences in survival among species. This one, the tropical sub, this tropical subtitled species, Stichodactyla, oh my tongue, Stichodactyla tapetum, uh, and the local intertidal species, the green one, Alactinia viratra, they survived, they appear to have survived better than the other three species. Now I say appear because I haven't, as I said, I haven't done the analysis to tell for sure. So I have to spend more time looking at exactly what happened. But I have some initial thoughts about some reasons for the differences. Um, one of my gut feelings is that survival may have been better if I, the water flow had been higher. Now, I didn't, I've not done this before, so I didn't know what was required. But if you think about intertidal anemones, they're normally subject to strong waves and lots of surge and lots of changes in water. In the experiment I ran, well, there was a change of water in the tubs approximately every 30 minutes. So they certainly weren't sitting in stagnant water. But the flow was constant and compared with what happens in rock pools, it was relatively weak. And even the subtidal species normally experience quite a lot of surgy conditions. If you're not a diver, that wouldn't make any sense, but it's not just still and quiet at the bottom of the ocean generally. Um, the other factor I've thought about is food. So in the wild, these animals would eat a range of foods, basically whatever comes within the grass. And I fed them to satiation three times a week, but I only fed them prawns. So I bought, like they ate very well. I bought them local king, green, green king prawns, peeled and chopped them finely. For the smaller anemones, I made a prawn smoothie even, um, and they were happy enough to eat what I gave them but maybe they weren't getting all the nutritional needs that they required, or the, the nutritional needs may not have been completely met, particularly over such a long time period. So for me, it's almost as if the research has generated more questions in my mind 
than it answered, which is, I guess, how science often works. So what does all this mean? Well, firstly, we know that in Tapia quadrupella, the bubble tip anemone is the most popular sea anemone species in the marine aquarium trade. I wasn't surprised about this, having played around a lot on the relevant social media and hobbyist forums, but it's good to have it confirmed. And as I said, uh, anecdotal information is quite different to scientific data. Now, these popularity details have possible significance for fisheries management. For example, knowing which are the most popular species means management decisions can be made with this information in mind and maybe the most popular species in a certain area would be offered more protection or, or uh, bag limits put on or something. Depends on the area. I'm certainly not going to suggest I know uh, how people should manage particular fisheries. We also know that Aquarists and businesses are concerned about the long-term sustainability of the anemone trade and would prefer to buy and are willing to pay a premium for sustainably procured anemones. This indicates, post me, possible support for sea anemone mariculture, which in turn has the potential to provide sustainable livelihoods for people in developing countries. It also offers the possibility of reducing collection pressure on coral reef ecosystems. And for me personally, that's a great idea. In terms of sexual reproduction, sexual mariculture, that's the one involving the spawning, we have some starting information about anemone larval rearing in terms of densities, feeding preferences, and suggestions for further research. In terms of asexual mariculture, we also have some starting information about methods for species other than Antarctica quadricolor and suggestions for areas for potential further research. Now, obviously, I would have liked all my anemones to have survived and thrived and be able to offer really clear, successful methods for sexual and asexual sea anemone mariculture for the world. I would love to go, here, this is how you do it. Real science, however, involves a whole lot of small steps and discoveries along the way. It's not very often that you get a eureka moment. So I hope that the small steps I've taken will help lead to a more sustainable sea anemone trade in the future. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions, Stephen? Uh, on, there we go. Now we're unmuted and I'm sharing my video. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nicola. That was quite interesting and uh, a great start to hopefully an industry that will lead to a sustainable um, product really because um you know as we know um uh, especially since finding nemo everyone wants a nemo and everyone wants a ne an, an enemy fish so uh without further ado um while um while i'm kind of we're wrapping up our little talking um if anyone has a question um you can go down at the bottom of your screen um click into that and type in a question if you have one so um, if anyone has that now, go, please go ahead. There's nothing's come up yet. Oh, maybe I must maybe have Nicola's answered done all them your, all. You've, you've, you've answered all their questions. Oh, yeah. So um, we'll give it another minute here. But um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been a, an interesting uh, to watch your work progress through time. And um, I'm sure you have learned quite a bit about um, all the intricacies of of culturing, especially invertebrates. Um, an enemy at the best of times aren't easy to keep, um, even in their adult form. So um, well done for for that. Um, well, thank you to you for helping teach me how to grow, uh, how to hatch, hatch, um, oh, I'll come to that quick question, how to hatch Artemia. I had no idea it was, you might remember how excited I was about sea monkeys. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. Okay, question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, question. So, first question is, what preys on anemones? What do, what do, what, what um, things eat? Quite a few fish. So, that's one of the bonuses for an anemone of having a, an anemone fish living in it, is that although they're cute looking little fish and they're not very big, the anemone fish are really, um, I would even say, aggressive as far as looking after their home. So, they're, it's basically fish. A lot of, I, I don't know what an anemone tastes like. I've never eaten them. I do know I, there are recipes for them. But, um, and of course, the fish don't cook them. 
But yeah, lots of fish um, eat sea anemones if they're given a chance. Okay. Will, will people do what they say about preferring captive bred? Joe, I don't know for sure. That's why I said, you know, would you prefer? But certainly one of the interesting things I found reading the comments in the um, survey results, sorry, the survey responses, there were quite a few chances people had to, um, like there were open text places where they could just tell me whatever they wanted. And well before they reached the questions uh, about sustainability, people were saying things like, I won't buy sea anemones because I can't buy captive bred ones. Um, and things like, I, I will only buy captive bred animals because I'm concerned about the sustainability of the trade. So I think there's um, a reasonable chance that a lot of people will actually buy captive bred if we can get it happening. Um, no, something else came into my mind that's gone again. Sorry, disappeared. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I think that's a good point, um, Nicola, yeah, because um, one of the issues that can, can crop up in this industry is that they might say that they're captive, captive bred, but um, so trying to put markers or tags oh. or something on, on the animals is definitely um, something that uh, when I was working in the giant clam industry in, in the Solomon Islands, they definitely had, um, we were definitely looking at um, ways of, of marking the animals to make kind of confirm that they were um, captively, captively bred, perhaps with your um, asexual cuttings, maybe you might be able to see that scarring line to see if, you know, kind of to prove that perhaps that is a captive bred. Uh, yeah, um, it's, maybe. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that one. That is, that's a really good point um, because I can pick one up and go, yeah, it was captive bred and it might not be. One of the problems there is that it's almost impossible. You can't tag an anemone. There's, there's, there are really no long-term methods. You know, maybe a fish, there are actually things, I don't know if they do this in the tray, but you can do little fin clips and that stays clipped. A bit like a, like a chunk out of your ear. You can't do that with an anemone, it'll just heal. Um, so yes, proving that they're captive bred can be challenging. Um, I don't know the answer to that. That's beyond the scope of my PhD, but it's a really interesting question. Yeah, um, it's important, important to address, yeah. Um, um, Ellie, Ellie has written, um, what's the most popular substrate for sea and enemy? Um, she noticed that there are a few off Bribery Island in sand with no apparent attachment to rocks or coralline algae. Yeah, that's two really good points there, Ellie. Um, I'll answer the second one first because it's easier. They're not the same as the, um, they're not the same algae as in corals. Um, there hasn't been nearly as much research done into them. Um, that's one of the areas I'd like to go to. It's, again, it's beyond the scope of my PhD, but it's a little, I've got a list of things I want to go on to. And one of them is which species of algae live in sea anemones. But as far, uh, some of them are symbio, is it just changed the name? But anyway, there are, there are big algae and there are small algae and some of them, they're, they're similar. So they're definitely not the same species. Um, some of them may be in the same families, but there's not a lot known about them. Um, substrate, no, we don't know the most popular substrate. The anemones I know of, all like some, uh, sorry, most of the anemones I know of like something hard. So they will often put their foot down. Yes, Joe. yeah, well, you can do that. Um, they will put their foot down through the sand and stick to a solid substrate. They, there are some that bury themselves in sand. They're called sand anemones. There are some that swim. I can't say their name because it's got P's and H's and Y's and L's in it. I don't, but they're called a swimming anemone. Um, and they will hang on to um, seaweed. And I have a picture of one of those tiny little, the, the red ones that I said, the intertidal lock pool ones. The very first juvenile of those that I saw, I actually spotted because it was a teeny little one and I didn't have my glasses on, so I didn't even know what it was at the time, but it was attached to seaweed. I took its photo, came home and went, oh, that's an anemone. Um, I haven't seen them very often on seaweed, but sometimes they stick to, to um, soft things like, like seaweeds. So they have a variety of preferences, but a lot of them like a hard substrate. Question um, I have, Nicola, mm. with the, uh, with the um, symbiotic algae, 
are they are they when they're uh, going through sexual reproduction are they passed on the algae yes yeah which is really cool because corals aren't but now, I'm not a coral expert, so there might be one out there who says it's different, but as far as I know, the majority of corals are born, so to speak, without their algae. So then they find somewhere they settle, they have to find the algae in the water. The spots, that's why I pointed out the spots in that microscope image, that passed on, there's a proper term that I can't think of at the moment, basically it's passed on maternally. So it's they're in that their algae, algal cells are in the eggs. When the, when the female... See an anemone releases the eggs, the algae is already there, which is really cool. It means the animal can start photosynthesizing straight away. Yeah, which makes it a little easier for culturing as well. So you're yes. not needing to chase down um, symbiotic algae. That's fantastic. And mm. yeah, and just mm. to, I'll just, uh, I, I will uh, um, voice out Joe's um, uh, statement <laughs> because we won't hear this one with, with the recording, but uh, oh, of course, uh, PhD in, in, in developing a method for tagging an enemy. Yes, Joe, that sounds like a great uh, idea. We will we'll get you on board and we can start uh, right away. But yeah, tagging is, is an important one, especially when we're talking about the, in the trade aquarium trade, because there mm. will be um, people trying to say make a quick, uh, quick buck from a, a wild uh, animal versus something that can have a tag of being um, you know, captively bred. So, yeah. They, really there, have been, there have been some schemes, none of which has really stuck um, for identifying captive bred animals of various sorts. And there has been some work done on tagging anemones, um, but it still really hasn't, there's nothing conclusive. Um, I think part of the problem is they renew their cells so often that, that, that you can put a little bit of um, fluorescent dye, but it just, Vanishes. Yeah. Not possible. Yeah. There, I think it'll be worked out when we get to it. Fantastic. All right. I think that's all our questions for the evening. But I do again want to thank everyone for joining in. We'll have another, I, I imagine, another virtual event uh, in two months' time. Watch this space. But I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And I also want to thank Nicola for taking time to explain her years of work now so thank you very much nicola thank you stefan nice to see you even if it's not in person that's right no yeah, fantastic thanks, thanks everyone in the audience great yeah have a great evening everyone we'll see you later Bye. -bye. thank you bye